We are very happy to have Alec from uh, Harvard. He will tell us about reconstructing the spectrum of states in quantum gravity. Please. Thank you very much. OK. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk. And thank you very much for coming. Um, just before I start, uh, let me just say a few things. I am recover. I, uh, a few weeks ago, um, I was sick, and I just have a lingering cough. Uh, so occasionally, I might cough, uh, but I'm not sick now. I, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, also, please feel free to stop and ask questions, um, as many questions as as, as you'd like. Jamie, did you see us? Sorry. Oh, okay. I can. I can wait. I think these are the upcoming talks. So there's also going to be a chalk talk tomorrow, and uh, by both me and Georges. But that's going to be on a different topic, and there's going to be a KCP talk by Georges. Who also. Mm -hmm. where, where is the chalk talk? It's in astrophysics. In astrophysics. What time? It's the pizza talk. Oh, is that noon? This noon. It's at noon on the fifth floor in the. Tuesday, but tomorrow is it uh, Pranay also giving a talk? But not at noon. Uh, sorry, sorry, who's giving who's giving Prana is, is Pranay talking tomorrow? Pranay? When? Look at the uh, it's, it's lunch. So it's yeah. 30 on third floor. Sorry, I made chaos. <laughs> <laughs> what is the yeah. Pranay talk for? And also uh, I'll be staying here for three weeks. I'm staying at um, Office 345. So if there's anything in this talk that you would like to talk more about or you have questions or you want to chat about physics, please feel free to uh, talk to me. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about reconstructing the spectrum of states in quantum gravity. This is going to be on a work in collaboration with Rashmish Mishra and Max Wiesner. Um, they're both great, amazing physicists. They're postdocs at Harvard and uh, hopefully the work is going to be out next week. And someone pointed out to us that our initials in, in order alphabetically spelled BMW. So we were just going with it. And <laughs> so this is this is the logo of the collaboration. <laughs> BMW collaboration is actually like yeah. played. It's it's you need to have fun with it. Yeah. It's already one. one. Yeah. 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 Shout out to All right, the logo is important. Uh, yeah, the logo, as long as we have the logo, we shouldn't have a problem getting funded. Oh. <laughs> All right, so um, let, me, let, me, let me first start by talking about um, what we've learned about massive states in quantum gravity, but from string theory. So the very first part is going to be top down. I'm just going to review some general lessons that we've learned, and then I'm going to quickly shift into more bottom up ideas. Okay, <clears throat> so this is a very um, simplified picture, but something that we've learned from string theory is that if you have a weakly coupled string, um, if you look at the, the string excitations, these form a tower and their masses start of the order of M string, but the masses go high. And if you plot the entropy of these states, and here by entropy, I just simply mean the logarithm of the number of microstates at a given, at, at given mass, you will see that there's a linear behavior because the number of microstates in string for free string is, are, is exponential. So you will have some linear curve, but of course, above a certain energy, these string states will collapse into a black hole. So that formula that we have for entropy should be replaced with the entropy formula for a black hole. And there we expect to have an area law. And what you see on the right side is just the area law, but expressed in terms of mass rather than in terms of the radius. <laughs> and if you just had these two equations, you could have asked, where do these two expressions meet each other? And the answer that you get is that the, they meet at a uh, mass scale that corresponds to a black hole with the radius of the order of string length. And the mass of that black hole would go like M string divided by G string squared. And this is the old story of string black hole transition, particle black hole transition. Um, and again, this is a simplified story because near that transition point, these are no longer free strings. So you would have maybe horowitz polshinsky solution, but this is a kind of first order picture that you would expect from string theory. But there are some very important lessons even in this picture. Um, so one of the important lessons is that there's a hierarchy of scales. Um, there, there, there's M string there, and that's where the string tower starts. <clears throat> And the mass of the smallest black hole is not M Planck. It's much bigger than M Planck. And it's controlled by the string coupling. 
So the weaker the string coupling, the higher you should go in the string tower to see it collapse into a black hole, right? So um, M Planck is between these two scales. It's between M string and the mass of the smallest black hole. This is, this is the power of just from kappa, from kappa ten, you say, or kappa yeah. dimension. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I mean the kappa enters in the uh, entropy formula for the black hole, and then if you just yeah use the the string connection between M string and M Planck, you see that. And interesting thing is that this picture, I mean, the mass of the black hole will always be M string over G string squared, and the radius will be L string regardless of dimension. So in all dimensions, the same thing works. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, now, so let me maybe go back. So one thing we're learning here is that black holes have a smallest radius. I mean, if you trust this picture, this is telling us that black holes have a smallest radius. There's a, there's a smallest black hole. And intuitively, this is just telling you that the smaller you make the black hole, the bigger would be the curvature at its horizon. And if the curvature gets too big, you would not trust your kind of this, this solution as a solution to Einstein equations because there are all sorts of corrections and the field theory can break down. Um, and, and the radius that sets that curvature scale is given by string length, which is telling you that the cutoff for that field theory is given by M string, which is something we know in string. So uh, another way of saying it is that, so this is from the paper by uh, Damien, Kamran, Max, and David, and these are the last names. And um, so in, in string theory, you not only have the Einstein term in the action, but you also have all these higher derivative corrections to the action. And the energy scale that controls these higher derivative corrections is M string. So when the curvature scale gets too big, you cannot just cut it off at finitely many terms. So you, would, you wouldn't trust the field theory solution anymore. And that exactly tells you that the smallest black hole that you can trust the solution is when the curvature near the horizon is of the order of M string squared. But more generally, this is telling you that in any theory of quantum gravity, if you have some energy scale controlling these higher derivative corrections, that's your quantum gravity cutoff. In string theory, this happens to be M string. And uh, as I mentioned before, in weakly coupled string theory, there's this hierarchy between cutoff of quantum gravity and M Planck. So it's not true that M Planck is that cutoff. It can be, we can, we can reach that cutoff much uh, uh, below, like much earlier than M Planck. Any questions about this? Okay. So um, I already told you that that previous picture was simplified in some ways, but it was simplified in one very big way which is that it didn't have extra dimensions in it. And in string theory, we can have extra large dimensions. And it turns out that if you have large extra dimensions, there is a much richer story than the one that I told you. So let's start from the black hole side. So you start from a big black hole and you decrease its mass, right? So you would trust the baconstein hawking entropy uh, formula. But below a certain mass, now you have two black hole solutions you have your lower dimensional black hole, which is really a black string that wraps the circle, but you also have higher dimensional black hole that is localizing the extra dimension. And it turns out for radius smaller than the compact dimension, the second one has bigger entropy and is more stable. So the picture that you would get is that below a certain mass, the lower dimensional black hole solution is unstable. It will, um, decompose into these higher dimensional black holes that are localized in the extra dimension. And because these, these higher dimensional black holes have higher dimensional area law, their entropy versus mass dependence is also different. So you would see a change in the, in the entropy in terms of mass. And that's the Gregory Laflamme phase transition. So as we go from large black holes, as we decrease the mass, first we have the usual beckinstein hawking formula. Then we get to a region when the radius of the horizon is smaller than the size of the extra dimension. The entropy changes. You get, the, you get uh, an exponent with a, with a different exponent. And the M Planck here is also the higher dimensional M Planck. And everything will work out so that these two curves meet where they're, where they're supposed to meet. And then you have the string tower. So you have more phases. Yeah? 
so this instability is true both kinematically and thermodynamically and here we are concerned with thermodynamics and not the kinetics of how fast that instability will occur. yeah great question so the, in, in the in the original gergel of Lam, i think the um the motivation was really something different that if you have a long black string not something that's trapped but if you have a long black string what is the does it have classical instability right but um here we're saying and and you know that that analysis turns out to apply exactly when you know the um, the radius of the horizon is small enough compared to the extra dimension that you can treat it as long black string. So there's that classical instability, um, but also there is a because we know that these black holes have quantum properties and they they Hawking evaporate. There's also this quantum instability and they will uh, decay into those more stable states. Does that answer your question? Any any other question? Okay, so, but, but there, there, there's also something super interesting about this picture. This is telling us that if you have extra dimension, there are two ways that you can see that extra dimension. One is by looking at very, very high energies, which is the black hole states. Another way is by looking at very, very low energies because you get KK particles, you get Kaluza Klein Tower for this extra dimension. And this is one of many examples of UV IR connections in quantum gravity. Um, very often in the spectrum of states, when you have some ingredient in quantum gravity, you would see it both at UV and very IR. And this is one example, and I'll come back to this. What do you mean by the KK states in the IR? Yeah, it's a great question. So here uh, I'm talking just about the Kaluza Klein reduction of graviton, for example. So if you have a radius, which is much bigger than your string length, then but if you take the higher dimensional graviton and you Kaluza Klein like dimensional reduce it, then these are not low energies like our low energies these are energies much greater than what we think of them yes yes this is yes so okay a great great question i think so i would highly recommend going to george's talk which uh, he's, he's going to talk about if these have phenomenological implications especially in cosmology but uh for the for the sake of this talk i would uh by, by low energy i mean much smaller than m flat or much smaller than m string so your IR is anything greater than the compactification scale? Anything energies lower than the inverse compactification scale? Is your IR? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, or or anything up to M string. But also, uh, most of the things I will be talking about are statements about the limit and about the weak coupling limits, which I will define shortly. And um, in the weak coupling limits, you often what you get is that you push the black hole transition scale up and you push the, uh, th that light tower scale down. And these two kind of almost mirror each other. Um, but, but the interesting thing is that there's, there's something at energies much above M Planck that is signaling the same physics that you can also probe at energies much below M Planck. And there's a very constrained structure on the spectrum of massive states in quantum gravity. Any, any other questions? Okay, so this is the picture that we have, and because this is the picture I'm going to go come back to a lot, I'm also going to have it here. I'll say what this alpha is, just so that you can look at it. So here, we're just saying that if the entropy in some phase goes like mass to the alpha, that's our constant alpha, because in these phases, it's polynomial versus mass, that's our constant alpha. It's just a good bookkeeping way of tracking these phases. Okay, so... Um, Let's just list some observations that we see in string theory. And in the rest of the talk, I'll try to understand what is the bottom up reason for these observations. Like, if we the, um, forget about string theory, how can we understand these in, a, in an arbitrary theory of quantum graph? So, the first observation that we see is that alpha is bigger than one for black holes and is smaller than or equal to one for non black hole states. Whether it's higher dimensional or lower dimensional, it doesn't matter. There's this split between black holes and non-black holes, and you can probe that using alpha. The second observation is that when, whenever alpha goes below uh, what Bekensee-Hawking formula tells you, but it's still bigger than one. So when it's a black hole, because it's bigger than one, but it goes below what Bekensee-Hawking formula tells you, it, it's a higher dimensional black hole. And you, therefore, you have extra dimension. Can we argue for that somehow from bottom up? 
The, the third observation is that the, this smallest black hole, the radius of the smallest black hole is the same energy scale that controls the higher derivative corrections and therefore is the quantum gravity cutoff. And it's also the same energy scale that's, that sets the beginning of this um, alpha equals one phase, right? Uh, in the string theory case, this was M-string. So can we argue for that, that the radius of the smallest black hole has to be related to higher derivative corrections? Said differently, that if I tell you that you need to have that particle uh, black hole transition, that somehow that generates some terms in the effective action. What is the technical definition of smallest black hole? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So here, um, I mean, we, we can define it in, in, a, in a few different ways. One is that, uh, I mean, the, the very smallest black hole, we, we don't define it as a very sharp definition. It can be, um, it can be, you know, I, I don't know if it's a first order phase transition or, or not, but but there's a, everything that I will say is of, of phase is about in what? Between black holes and particles. For example, the entropy, whether it's first derivative is discontinuous or not versus versus mass. But one way that um, you can define it is that if you can study the properties of that bound state at that mass using the Einstein equations, something like that. If, if there's a bound state that you can, uh, you can trust the Einstein field equations with By that definition, wouldn't you say it's tautological that the first black hole, the smallest black hole, sets the importance of the higher derivative terms? That's the scale for that, right? That, so there would be nothing to show, right? So if uh, so, the, the the previous argument, the common law, is that if you do have these higher derivative corrections, then there is some divergence at the curvature scale. But why do we have to have these higher derivative corrections? All of them controlled by the same energy scale. I mean, that's one question. The second question is that actually it turns out these higher derivative terms um, have some independent factors. So I, I had this R to the N time something, which goes like M string to the N, has some independent factor that uh, can, can become very small at large ends. And it's not very clear that it will necessarily diverge. So that argument is very heuristic. I will, I will give a much better argument for, for why you will get those higher derivative corrections. But yeah, if you do have a higher derivative expansion and it does diverge at some curvature scale, then then you can say by definition that's a small star. But I'm gonna I'm gonna really go the other way that if you um, by by studying the amplitude, so this is this is kind of a like soon to come like overview. But it's I'm gonna look at the amplitudes that will gen that that are you know uh, supposed to that you can use the effective field theory to calculate those amplitudes and argue that. The notion of smallest black hole will force the amplitude to behave in a certain way that requires those higher derivative terms. But maybe when, when I get there, we can talk. Any any other questions? Okay, so the other observation is that why is that the the, the in strength theory, the only power that we see um, of states with masses below lambda, the only ones that come in towers and these weak coupling limits are always only Kaluza Klein reductions. And the last one is that why is it that between lambda and m min, you have this phase with alpha equals one? This is very specific behavior. This is telling you that the microstates grow, the number of microstates go exponential with energy. And this is the Hagedorn behavior of string states, but in general, in quantum gravity, why do we have to have that? Any questions? Well, about the you don't if the string coupling is order one. Sorry? I said you right. don't. I'm string coupling so coupling. glad you asked. <laughs> yeah, because that's not always true. Um, so here, everything that I said was assuming that there's this hierarchy between lambda and m min. The, the mass of the smallest black hole and the quantum gravity cutoff. And that's not always true. One example is, as, as you said, uh, when the string coupling is one. Another example is M theory. And M theory, 11, the M theory, all of these are of the same order. All of these are in flank, right? So all the observations I said are specifically for when there's a hierarchy between lambda and, and M flank. And, um, and to understand that better, yeah, I mean, why is it that um, 
we get so many states when there is this hierarchy. I mean, what does what do these states have with this hierarchy? So this is a very heuristic explanation, but we can think of it like this, that if you somehow, for example, have some moduli that controls the coupling of some states, um, and if you go to some weak coupling regime, the reason you get tower of states is that there are these states that used to be black holes because they were strongly self-interacting. And by decreasing their coupling to itself, now you're making them uh, particle black instead of black hole. So you're kind of peeling off states from what used to be black hole. And you're pushing up the mass of the smallest black hole, and you're pushing down the quantum gravity cutoff. So the, the reason kind of, th this is kind of explaining that why tower goes hand in hand with, ha with having some weak coupling limits. Because um, what, what you end up doing is that you have these states that if you sit in, the, in some strong coupling parameter are just black holes, but by tuning down their coupling, you're making them particle-like and therefore you get this tower of particles. Now, the way this actually works out in string theory is that there's usually some scalar field that controls these couplings. And when you take the web of that scalar field to infinity, you go to a weak coupling. And um, this, has, this was quantified in this conjecture called distance conjecture. And I want to review that conjecture, what it says, because I will argue for some aspects of it. I cannot say anything about some other aspects of it. But it's both phenomenologically very interesting. For that, I highly recommend going to George's talk. But theoretically very interesting, because it's been used for a lot of bottom-up arguments. Now, what is distance conjecture? So this is uh, from, so Ugri and Vafa formulated this back in 2006, and it's based on this observation in string theory that in Minkowski vacua, when you take a scalar field and take its web to infinity, this can be any scalar field when you go to the asymptotic limit, a few things happen. The first thing that happens is that you get a tower of light states. The mass of a tower of states goes to zero. But also, there is a tower that not only goes, their masses go to zero, but they're also weakly coupled to each other. Um, moreover, their, their masses follow a very specific pattern. The, the, the mass goes exponential versus uh, the field distance in the moduli space. And here, phi is canonically normalized, meaning that its kinetic term is one half d mu phi d mu phi. Now, there were follow-up versions of this conjecture that, based, again, all of this is based on observations of string theory. It's not bottom-up at this point. Um, that based on observations of string theory, they made it sharper and sharper. So another observation was that this lightest tower is always either a Kaluza-Klein tower or it's uh, the excitations of some weakly coupled string. We have membranes. Those membranes can have you know, states or excitations, but those are never the lightest tower. The lightest tower always happen, happens to be excitations of, of a weakly coupled string or it includes a point. And more than that, the lambda is, is, is a very specific, like a very sharply bounded number. Um, lambda is always greater than one over square root of d minus two, where d here is the dimension of space time. And it only equals that number when the lightest tower is a string tower. The, the last one almost follows from the previous one. So that's not hard to show, please. If I take a two cycle in K3, for example, uh, and have a D2 brain that wraps that two cycle and I take the area to zero, then the lightest state is a state of the D2 brain. That's at finite distance. What? That's at finite distance. Yeah, you just go to a boundary here in the, in the moduli space. Yeah, that's a, that's a boundary of the moduli space. That's a finite distance. But that's, that's a great so what uh, I guess, what's the definition of infinity? Yeah. So here, we're saying that move on a geodesic. And if that geodesic takes you to, at like, at, to infinite distance in the field space, then this happens. So just to understand, yeah. Jeff's example is getting a light particle, but there's no tower of stuff above it. Is that the point? What about multiple wrapped D brains? Is that really a tower? Are they stable? Yeah, I mean, in that example. 
I think they're BPS if it's not. Well, these, these aren't stable. These either. aren't stable either. They're only like parametrically long enough. Huh. I think they're. This is presuming a metric and, and some understanding of what quantum corrections will do to that metric. Yeah. Yeah, so so this is, I mean, the, the assumption is that this is with the, uh, you know, quantum corrected metric. And for example, in some cases, um, yeah, I mean, you can you can have quantum corrections to the metric that brings a, a supposed infinite distance to a finite distance. But this is with the with the metric that shows up in the effective action and the one particle you're using for effective action. Mm -hmm. and in some sense, this is all tied to Susie, I think, because things get much richer when you when you break Susie. Yeah, so I mean, because this is formulated in Minkowski, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. in some sense, it, it is tied to Susie. There, there's a very good question there that, for example, if, if you have a potential, do you expect the same thing to happen? Because if there's a, a, a FRW solution that takes you to an infinite distance of the moduli space, can you still say that there's a tower of light states? And we expect the same thing to be true there, but um, the definitions get you know, much trickier. Actually, in that case, there is a bottom-up argument using kind of these existence of boundary observables and holography for how, how you can bound lambda in specific cases based on the potential, but formulating the conjecture itself becomes much trickier when you get the potential. So this is, this is the distance conjecture, and I mean, these are more sharpened version of it. Um, I okay, so I will not comment. I will not argue for this last point. I will. Uh, I, I don't have a bottom up argument for, for the last point, and um, and I think it is it is a very important question because it's a very sharp thing. So I think it, if it is true in quantum gravity, I do believe there should be an argument for it because it's such a sharp statement about these infinite distance limits. But I don't have that. I don't have any argument for that. But I said this to explain what. Um, kind of but limits I'll uh, be studying. Yes. The way they were formulated is because of examples that show this. Or yeah. The... Yeah. This is really. I mean, the motivation for it is. So this is. I didn't formulate this. This is the Uguri and Bapa. But yeah. but the motivation for it, yeah, is based on example. This is the, the conjecture at its core is quantifying dualities. So in string theory, we just see that when you go to infinite distance limits, to opposite directions, you have dual descriptions. But these descriptions use different light states. And this is just a statement that to any infinite distance limit that you go, there's some description that works. Here. Okay. So now, um, what, is it, what are the assumptions that we're gonna make in this talk? So I'm gonna be looking at some limit in the moduli space and I don't know, uh, so I'm not gonna make any assumptions about how you should change phi to achieve this limit. I'm just gonna assume that there is such limit and everything that I say is about these limits. So um, there's gonna be disconnect between how to translate everything that I say about the fields, uh, scalar fields and scalar field distance. I don't have any comments on that. I, uh, I'm, not, I'm not gonna be able to provide a bottom-up argument on that. But the assumption here is that there's a limit somehow in the moduli space that lambda over n plan goes to zero. And that's my definition of decoupling. And that because as, as you go in this limit, because as, as we argued, this is like, uh, you know, peeling off black hole microstates. And so what was lambda without, oh, without having this limit to begin with? Yeah, so, so lambda is the, the quantum gravity cutoff. This is lambda is a cutoff where um, the effective field theory doesn't work anymore. And, and is controlled by this higher derivative expansions. And you want this to be uniform on every higher derivative term in the effective action? It, yeah, good, good question. Um, and no, I mean, it can be independent. There, there, there can be numbers. So usually, I mean, practically the way it works is that, uh, for example, they look at the R to the fourth coefficient and they define lambda using that. But there is an assumption here that, for example, if you, um, that, that the, ener the energy scale dependence of all of them is polynomial in one energy scale. And yeah, the assumption is that if you define lambda with different ends, but if you fix your n, all of these will give you the same energy scale up to logarithmic terms. Sorry, what was there a question here? 
But lambda, what you call M string at some point? Oh, good, good. So in, in string theory and weakly coupled string theory, lambda is M string, but now we're going to move in the territory of not assuming that this is string theory. But in the string case, this uh, happens also? Yes, yes. So in string case, if you take the coupling of the string to zero, lambda, oh, because lambda is M string, I see. Yeah. Okay. Because M string over M plank is controlled by G string. And we're, we're not going to talk about how this relates to delta phi, which I think is a very important question, but I won't have anything to say about that. But I will talk about what happens to these light states at this weak coupling point. So assuming that such a such a point exists, and assuming that there are, you, you will get like a weak coupling description for these particles that are now lo no longer black holes, we'll talk about what what are the properties of those particles. Okay. Um, now let's start the let, let's start going through the observations that we said. So the first observation was that alpha is greater than one if and only if the state is is a black hole. And so we're going to go from the easier statements to harder statements. Um, we'll start with this. By the state, you mean the typical state? What exactly do you mean? There's lots of states at high energies that are black holes. No, we, a typical state, yeah. Typical state. And you mean that's how you would describe it macroscopically? Or I mean, could, yeah. That, that you can, that, that a typical state. Object. Sorry? You think that a black hole is a composite object, it's a, it's a macro state description. Yeah, yeah, but but we're saying that uh, you can you can describe that state using some Einstein, um, you know, solution to the equation of motion that you can trust up to the Schwarzschild radius, up to the horizon radius. Okay. Okay. So one way is, I mean, almost trivial. If you have a black hole, why alpha is greater than one? Um, I mean, we know the Bekenstein Hawking formula for any dimension. We know alpha is greater than one. The other part is a, is a trickier part. But for the other part, so we want to see if alpha is if in some energy regime, if alpha is smaller than, sorry, if, um, so, so we've already proven that if it's black hole, alpha is bigger than one. Now we want to prove that if it's not a black hole, if the typical state is not a black hole, then alpha is smaller than one. In other words, we want to we want to say that if you're uh, talking about that particle system in the in the weak coupling limit, for that system, alpha must be smaller than or equal to one. How, how did we get particles? How, how, why that? Why are this the only options? Um, why couldn't one, it be just some strongly interacting soup? No, no. Okay, okay. I see. I see. So all of these statements are about uh, yeah. I mean, particle states. So here we're talking about some some bound states that are localized in space. Okay, but the claim is seems that if out if the entropy goes with this uh, exponent, then it must be a black hole independent of of any other assumption of the claim. I mean, yeah. what if it was some some quantum system that didn't have a description in terms of particles? So so here we're we're saying so here we're making an assumption that there's this in the in the weak coupling limit. There's a point above which we have black hole, and below which we have some weakly coupled description for these states. So that's the assumption, and and then we want to see that if that weakly coupled system can produce alpha bigger than one. Okay, but why do we make the assumption that 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 it's either black holes or weakly interacting particles? For uh, I mean the and, and so the, the, there's some ener energy range you know so if if you're at finite points in the moduli space there are probably some states that are very strongly strongly coupled but we're saying that if you go to this infinite distance limit then uh, the microstates that are that are not black hole typically a typical microstate we assume that there's a weak coupled description for it I don't think that's really care so long as it's field theoretic right so uh, the issue here is about the density of states. So what's I the see. specific heated? Uh, but yeah, yeah, like, yeah. what's the specific heated finite temperature? I see. Okay, so field so theoretic thing to have that coefficient is less than one. Black holes that coefficient is bigger than one, and string with the yeah. oh. And we sort of envision that those are the only possibilities because those that's everything we know. Yeah. And I, you know, you can have sort of temporary, you know, windows where, like, you know, for instance, the original QCD string, right, was something which yeah. has a linear 
density of states, but that only persists up to some uh, up to some scale. But these are not sharp cutoff transitions, right? They're the smooth ones, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And in the in the limit, if you if you track some you know certain microstates, in the limit you can talk about those microstates and whether density of states is so it, it becomes sharper and sharper in the limits as they come with people. So um, I mean, for for the particle system, that 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 system that exists at that recoupling limits, if the for for the partition function of it to converge, for us to have a canonical a canonical uh, ensemble description for it, um, you would need the number of microstates of the system. For example, if you put it in a box, to be sub exponential, because if it's super exponential, then the partition function diverges. But already there's a there's a problem here because you might say that well these are multi particle states these are not single particle states how do you know that the density of states of single particle states is sub exponential and so that's a there's a combinatorics argument that uh, if you if you have um, a density dens the density of states for some weakly coupled particles you can count the number number of multi particle states um, at, with at, with energy e in a box of finite size, and the, um, so this is something that we've shown. But and I'm I'm, I'm happy to go into more detail um, if you want. But essentially, the claim is that if uh, S multi particle is super linear, then the density of single particle states that generates that should also be super linear. If it's sublinear, then this one also needs to be sublinear. Yes. So you could argue that like if the beta corresponds to something that's like smaller than some critical value then perhaps it's fine if it blows up like if i have particles below some hagedorn like temperature yeah so the for example the, the hagedorn i mean in, in, the, in the case of free string this this is saturated uh oh sorry 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 oh i see i see yeah i see i see what you mean um, yeah, so, so here the statement is that we want this to converge at least for sufficiently large beta. So the claim is that if for any beta you want this to converge, yeah. let's take beta to be very, very large, very low temperature, yeah. then you would need this to be solid. But like it, it's unclear because you want to argue for the alpha to be uh, less than equal to one in some window, which it's not clear where that beta lies relative to that window. Yeah, so good, good. So this is this is telling you that, um, right, this is telling you that if you track, if you take the microstates that are there and will their masses will converge to something in the weak coupling limit, then the density of states of those, as long as the mass correction uh, is small, is should be sub-exponential. But, but here's the thing, we also expect the mass correction to get big when this becomes black hole, because the mass correction is the self interaction of the particle with itself, right? And even, for example, in the case of string theory, when we consider the horus polshinsky solution, which takes, in, takes into account those corrections, it doesn't change the order of magnitude of the, uh, of the entropy behavior. If you still look at the, the entropy of the dominant phase and all the dimensions where you have the horus polshinsky solution, it's still linear. It might change the coefficient, but it's still But I mean, you, you, you could have asked, so why, I mean, how does black hole, how do black holes um, evade this? I mean, why couldn't you apply the same argument to black holes and say that for black holes also, you should have uh, alpha sublinear. I mean, one is that we've already assumed weak coupling, which is not true for black holes. But also the other part is that here, I assume that I can put arbitrarily high amount of energy in that box because my partition function went all the way to energy infinity and when you turn on gravity, if you're not at that weak coupling limit, if you put too much energy, this will collapse into a black hole. So there is a maximum energy that you can put in the box. In other words, when you put an IR cutoff, which is the size of the box, you get a UV cutoff on how much energy you can put in the box. Okay. Now um, let's talk about, so any questions about the previous one? So now, now let's talk about the other observation that, okay, for black holes, why is it that um, if alpha is smaller than D minus two over D minus three, it needs extra dimension. In other words, if you have a D dimensional black hole, why is it that an alpha can never be smaller than D minus two over D minus three? Um, 
I mean, you can consider, for example, um, all sorts of corrections to effective field theory. You can consider black holes that have scalar profile and therefore their entropy gets correction from higher derivative terms it gets correction. The D minus two over D minus three is a very, it's kind of a very approximate way of saying it. It's only for Schwarzschild black holes. So can we make alpha smaller by looking at these uh, types of corrections? So for this one, um, we use weak energy condition. We don't have a, I mean, general argument, but, but the argument uses weak energy condition. There, there might be an argument using average null energy condition, but uh, you know, if yeah, you're interested in, in that, please talk to me after the talk. But using weak energy condition, we can show that any d-dimensional black hole that, that you consider, um, the, the alpha that it will give you is always, yeah, is always greater than or equal to d minus two over d minus three. I can give you the intuitive argument without, without the math. So roughly, intuitively speaking, the argument is, is, is this, that if you, um, if you consider, for example, a black hole with some scalar field profile or something outside, what you're doing at a fixed uh, area, you're increasing the mass of the black hole. You're increasing the ADM mass of the black hole because that energy that sits outside the horizon of the black hole is positive. So for a given area, you end up with more mass. So for a given mass, you end up with less entropy. Now, what happens is that you have these black holes that should asymptote to the Schwarzschild solution. But then for small energies, you, you might be saying that, oh, I have corrections that you know, change the entropy. But, but because they change the entropy and they lower it, they make this curve steeper. Therefore, they increase alpha. So all of these corrections to EFT, as long as you satisfy weak energy condition, you get alpha greater than D minus over D minus. So no D-dimensional black hole can have that. So if you see that, then, uh, and it's, it's a black hole, um, which means that it's a solution to some Einstein equations, it's not a solution to D-dimensional Einstein equations. I forgot the yeah. difference. Can you tell me the difference between weak and null in this case? Oh, okay. this is, I mean, this is roughly T0, 0, zero greater than zero. With upper limit. So in particular, you claim that you cannot get this exponent by a suitable combination of higher derivative corrections. Rather. Yeah. As long as they satisfy the weak energy. Exactly. But we can use locally violated as a string theory, no? Yeah. So it's uh, also, I mean, for example, this doesn't apply also to ADS, which is why I was saying that all of this is in Minkowski. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, this is this is more of a, I mean, this is a minimum assumption that so far we have like a really good argument that why alpha is greater than or equal to this. So I, I think it's, you know, some, some evidence for it. There's some argument, but yeah, I mean, it would be really good if we can have some argument using average null energy condition, which so far we don't have with very rigorous arguments. And in each one of these, there will be some assumptions, and I will say about the assumption. Okay, so the next statement, if you have uh, how, why the radius of the smallest black hole is, is related to higher derivative corrections to the, to the gravitational action. Okay, so for this one, we're going to start with amplitudes, and we're going to well, for, first, let me just say a few statements from you know older works that um, are very nice statements, and I'm going to be using them. So, about high energy gravitational amplitudes. So, if you consider two to two gravitational amplitude in, in impact parameter and energy, if you're looking at very high energy amplitudes as low impact parameter and high energy, you would expect this to go to to form a black hole, and then for this to decay into exactly two particles, the, the probability of that is exponentially small because essentially you're demanding the outcome of Hawking radiation to only be two particles. And, and that's why this amplitude is uh, expected to be exponentially suppressed, uh, like e to the minus entropy of the black hole. Now, uh, there's this very you know, beautiful result by Giddings and uh, Srednicki, which takes essentially the, the, the uh, I mean, one of the things that paper does is that what is the implications of that observation? And you can go from energy and impact parameter space to fixed angle to in terms of Mandelstam variables, in terms of S and T, 
And what you see is that because um, you have very, very small amplitude for small impact parameters and polynomial amplitudes for large impact parameters, you can roughly think of your black hole as a black disk, like as this process of a black disk where it blocks small impact parameters amplitudes and it allows high impact parameter amplitudes. And you get this oscillatory phase, which is just the edge diffraction. And that oscillatory phase shows up like that. E here is the center of mass energy. Now, this is just a phase, but if you can analytically continue this to the unphysical regime of the amplitude, so the Mandelstam variable T is negative in the physical regime, but if you analytically continue to the unphysical regime, then that phase becomes exponentially large. So your amplitude in the unphysical regime goes like this. So there's a regime in the amplitude, the unphysical regime, where by analytic continuation of the, of the actual amplitude, that really probes the black hole physics, that really tells you that, oh, it probes the horizon radius of the black hole, that something is happening at that radius. Okay. Now, if we look at that at energies of the order of that smallest black hole energy scale, um, then the amplitude we expect it to go like this, where uh, I just replaced the, short, the horizon radius with the radius of the smallest black hole, which is R min. Okay, so, so at that energy scale, you have this exponential suppression of amplitudes at low impact parameter, and then polynomial at high impact parameter. But that behavior where there's some impact parameter that you get this change from exponential to polynomial, that, um, I mean, we assume, but also it's true in string theory and everything, that we assume to be true even at lower energy scales. So as you go uh, for, for masses below the mass of the smallest black hole, we still expect to be, we still expect there to be some uh, change of behavior uh, with exponential suppression and polynomial suppression at some impact parameter, we call that BC of E. Um, and the way in, th this works in string theory is actually very nice. It's using grossman mendy saddles. Um, instead of going through the saddle of black hole, you go through saddles of strings. And that will give you that exponential suppression at low impact parameter. Um, but so here we're assuming that that behavior doesn't suddenly drastically change at M, -M even though the location of the impact parameter may change. So, so even at the, at the energy scales much below m min, um, this, this is telling you that you have, in the unphysical regime, you have this uh, exponential suppression, sorry, exponentially large amplitude in terms of t, but the coefficient is controlled by the impact parameter where this transition happens, and that can have some non-trivial dependence on the center of mass energy. So, then we use Regi boundedness of the amplitude, so this is another assumption, to argue that B should be, uh, can, can only depend logarithmically on E. Because if B depends polynomial on, on E, then uh, at the energy is much below black hole, you will violate Regi behavior. And that's telling you that up to logarithmic corrections, you should match, you, your B should match that R min. At, at the point of particle black hole transition. Therefore, your amplitude up to logarithmic correction should go like R min times square root of T. Now, then you can ask what type, what series of corrections in the effective field theory do I need to have that behavior for the amplitude, to reproduce that behavior for the amplitude? And um, because that has some, you know, you can tailor expand it in energy and that gives you square root of T times R min that will require a series of higher derivative corrections in the effective action that goes like that. So this is telling you that to match the, for the amplitude to match what you expect from black hole physics and uh, with the assumption of Regi boundedness that energy is much below uh, black hole uh, mass scale, you need higher derivative corrections that are controlled by the radius of the smallest black hole. So the quantum gravity cutoff should be inverse of the radius of the smallest black hole. Now, 
Uh, any, any any questions about this? Can you just say what exactly you assumed in bullet point one? Yeah, the range behavior. Yeah. So here we're just assuming that uh, the the amplitude and for fixed t in terms of s is polynomial. And because b appears in the exponent, not though, asymptotically. You mean it's some finite energy range? No, I, I, I mean as you increase s, but this is again with the assumption that the that weakly coupled theory that produces the amplitude for you. If you just look at that in the weak coupled regime, then that would give you. So well, often we make assumptions about the polynomial growth of the amplitude, but we mean at parametrically large s. But are yeah. you using it at not parametrically large s as well? No, no, we're, we're using a parametrically large S, but here parametrically large means S much bigger than lambda. Okay. I mean, uh, lambda square. So as long as E is much bigger than, uh, than lambda, so if you fix T and you take E to be much, much bigger than uh, both square root of T and lambda, then we expect it to be. Go like polynomial. But that two to two uh, exclusive amplitude that decays exponentially in the complex plane that I, that's not polynomially bounded and that is the correct behavior. Two to two amplitude. That, I mean, there was an exclusive two to two amplitude, right? That yeah. decayed exponentially. Oh, but that's in the in the black hole. So yeah, yeah. So in the, the in the in the black hole regime, uh, we don't expect the the ridge behavior to be true. So good, good. Yeah. So the the range of behavior, I mean, is is really a statement about that weakly coupled theory. Um, and you would expect, for example, the amplitude to go like s to the j if you do have some weakly coupled exchange with a particle of spin j. So the whole motivation for really range behavior is that you have some weakly coupled description that describes that amplitude for you. Um, yeah, and, and whenever Reggie behavior is assumed for any kind of amplitude, it's for energy scales below the black hole threshold. Black hole threshold is exactly when that B, which controls the exponent, starts to find polynomial energy dependence. Does that answer your question? It's okay, we can keep going. Okay, so now, um, so the other statement, why if you have a weakly coupled tower below lambda, it's a uh, close up line. Okay, so here, uh, consider, consider the, the, the black hole of size M, M min, that uh, smaller scale black hole that is described using effective field theory. So the effective field theory that correctly calculates the entropy of that. And the cutoff of this effective field theory is lambda. Um, and this could be a higher dimensional effective field theory. This could be a capital B dimensional effective field theory if we have extra dimensions. And we also allow for, um, you know, the, the, if you write an effective field theory, there could be defects, there could be brains that couple to that effective field theory. We also allow for that. Um, so let's say you also have some weakly coupled P brains. The, the reason I only consider weakly coupled is that these are the only things that will give me weakly coupled particles later. Um, yeah. And here by weakly coupled, I mean that the, uh, the self interaction of the brain to itself is weak enough so that if the extrinsic curvature of the, of the brain is smaller than its tension scale, then you can ignore the self-interaction. So if it's not sufficiently curved, then you can ignore the self-interaction. Okay, now, I mean, you can, you can get like part, part, particles in, in many different ways. You can uh, take the higher D-dimensional theory and you can you know, have bound states for this. You can, uh, the, the theory itself might have some, you know, weak coupling particles. But because we're looking at the theory sitting at the limits, that has finitely many capital D dimensional particles. So that cannot give a tower of states in the infinite distance. Limit. So the way you get infinitely many particles, if you do have that well defined limit at the end, is either by you know, um, by, by having some momentum profile along these extra dimensions, that somehow is giving you particles. Or the, these brains are getting really, really light. And because of that, you're getting some towers of particles. If the first case happens, you already have a kaluza klein tower. So I want to argue that second case doesn't happen. That if you have a weakly coupled brain, 
then the tension of the brain must be, uh, cannot go parametrically below lambda to the p plus one, where lambda is the, again, energy scale controlling the higher derivative corrections. Now, for that, if I only prove the statement for strings, the statement will follow for other brains, because then you can compactify it, compactify that theory, that Minkowski theory on, on torus, and then you can wrap these brains on torus, and then uh, as long as the radius of the torus is much bigger than your effective field theory cutoff, you should be able to do that. And then you can apply the statement for the string. Can you say what a weakly coupled brain, what, what do you get by that? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, good question. So by weakly coupled brain, I mean that if your brain is in a, a non-flat configuration, let's say if it's in a configuration that has some extrinsic curvature, if it's like close to itself, then as long as the extrinsic curvature is smaller than the tension scale of the brain, as long as it's not that close, then you can ignore any term other than the tension to estimate the self-energy. So the energy of that is given by the tension. For example, for D-brain, this is not true. For, for strings, when GS is smaller than one, this is true because the self-interaction through B mu nu is very small. But if GS gets bigger than one, then this is not true. So, so the question becomes why for strings, this is true. I mean, there should be some equality there to bigger than or equal to. By the way, close to finish. So um, why, why is it true for strings? So it's instructive to review how in, in string theory, we get higher derivative corrections of this type that are controlled by the tension. For a second, ignore the right picture, only look at the left picture. So the way it works in string theory is that string theory has this saddle, which is given just by the sphere diagram. This is how it looks like in space time. And you can also write these saddles with higher genus. Those would be the Grossman saddles. And um, when you write the action of the saddle, this will give you an amplitude that goes like this at high energies. This is the high energy limit of the Veneziano. And if to, to reproduce this amplitude, you would need higher derivative terms in the action that are given by, by a series like this, where T is the tension of the string. So this is how you get higher derivative alpha prime corrections in, in string theory, because of that sub. Right? Um, now you can ask, OK, what if, I mean, here there's an assumption that graviton is a string state. right? What if graviton is not a string state? Because I'm looking at graviton graviton scattering. Um, so can, can, can we say anything about it then if graviton is not the state of that string? Um, so yes, we can, because the, the action of this saddle is finite. So you can, you know, as, if, for example, you can cut the saddle at different places, the action will converge to that finite value. And if we regulate this, if we cut it, cut it at some finite point, then we also know the coupling of graviton to this, to this wall sheet. Uh, because that's just through the tension term. And I mean, you have to integrate over where you're inserting that, that uh, graviton vertex. But because we know how the graviton couples, we can estimate what this amplitude would give. And these vertex insertions will just contribute polynomially. They won't change the exponential behavior. So again, the contribution of this weakly coupled string, any weakly coupled string to gravitational amplitudes will require you to include these types of corrections to the effective action. So what this is telling us is that any weakly coupled string requires those types of corrections. And because we define lambda with the order of magnitude of those terms, lambda to the minus 2n should be bigger than that, which means that the tension of the string should be smaller than lambda squared. So that should be part of the correction that lambda captures, not it shouldn't be bigger than that. And finally, why between uh, lambda and m min, we expect alpha to be one. So um, for, okay, so, so the first statement is that we expect temperature to be bounded for black hole side. This is just the temperature of the smallest black hole because the smaller you make the black hole, the higher its temperature would be. And the temperature of the smallest black hole, as we already saw, uh, the, which is inverse of its radius is given by lambda. Um, but also on the you know, particle side, if you want to calculate the thermal partition function using Euclidean EFT, you cannot make the size of the thermal circle smaller than the cutoff of your EFT. And that, that size is given by lambda. So this is telling you that 
um, the circumference cannot be smaller than lambda inverse, therefore the temperature cannot be bigger than lambda. Okay. Now consider a box whose size is fixed in units of lambda and now go to the weak coupling limit. Now put more and more energy in this box and approach the temperature lambda. So as you approach this temperature, let's say for example, when you're at lambda half, um, because most of the massive particles are now way below your cutoff scale, it's, you have radiation in this box. You can treat it like radiation. So the energy inside the box is proportional to the energy of the radiation inside the box. But as we put more and more energy, before we get to the point where this collapses into black hole, which happens at that energy scale, um, sorry, the temperature cannot go above lambda. So the temperature is more or less fixed. So there's this energy window that the temperature, the order of magnitude of the temperature doesn't change. And the only way that happens is if the number of microstates are exponential because temperature is given by d log omega over d, I mean one over d. But again, this is the number of all states, all micro multi-particle states. So using the same statement that I made before, it's a combinatoric statement that if omega is exponential, single particle density of states is also exponential and vice versa. So this tells you that. So say that yeah. one more time. So the, why does it have to be exponential? Oh, because, so this is telling you that for, for a very large energy window, mm -hmm. uh, which gets longer and longer parametrically, the, um, the temperature is fixed. The temperature is proportional to lambda of the order of lambda. And that forces it to be yeah, so, Hagedorn in that, in that. I mean, in string case, that's exactly Hagedorn, yeah. yeah. And so this is telling you that d log omega over d e is, is kept fixed at lambda. Mm -hmm. And um, therefore, omega has to be exponential. This is my last slide. So uh, this was the picture that we started with, and we kind of motivated this picture from bottom up. Um, and you know, with the assumptions that we made, we argued that the lightest tower, if you have this weak coupling limits in this way, which is an assumption, then the lightest tower is either Kaluza Klein or something with the density of states of string. We cannot argue that it is string, but we can argue that it's alpha is equal to one. Um, and the reason that this follows is that you either have KK states, or if you don't have KK states, the lightest states are this, which we showed that have exponential density. And here we did not relate this to the fields, to, to the scalar fields, but that's a very important question, both for pheno and for theory, so um, which I, I think needs to be answered, but I don't have anything to say about that now. Thank you. The style of arguments that you're trying to make uh, say anything about the spins of various towers, or you put that in by as an assumption? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So one of the things that we see, one of the things that separate uh, Kaluza Klein towers from you know stringy towers is exactly that the spin of Kaluza Klein tower is bounded by two, but the other ones can have spin greater than two. So one of the things that this says is that uh, for 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 particles below lambda, you can you cannot have spin greater than two. But for the density of states between lambda and m min, I don't have any statement about spins. And indeed, in top-down examples, we have unbounded spin in string states. Let's thank Alec again. The one can be made up not overlap with the one we just got a thousand. Yeah, very nice to That's a standard one. Well, the one we